Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second lecture in the Black Lives Matter Beyond Borders lecture series. My name is Edwin Hill. I'm a joint appointed professor in the Department of French and Italian and the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to today's lecture by Asale Angel Ajani. For those who don't know, this lecture series is actually taking place in coordination with a class I'm teaching along with our doctoral student, Jérôme Gendreau at USC, entitled Black Europe. Um, this semester, we've been thinking about institutional racism and the dynamics of uh, anti-black uh, racism in the banlieue of youth in France. Um, but we haven't had a lot of time to think about dynamics of incarceration, which is a question that I know a lot of USC students and faculty are very passionate about. Um, while across the globe we say the names of black people and especially black women who've lost their lives at the hands and at the knees of the police if they're not simply riddled with bullets. Um, but as we say these names, sometimes I wonder if we forget the names of those black people and especially black women who've been jailed, who've been detained, who've been otherwise incarcerated and essentially institutionally thrown away in increasingly high numbers in countries uh, not only in the U.S. but also in places like France and Italy. That's why I'm especially excited for today's guest. Um, Professor Inhela Ajani is a writer, scholar, and critic of the carceral state. She's author of Strange Trade, the story of two women who risked everything in the international drug trade, which is a book we're reading in my course, Black Europe at the moment. She's also author of a forthcoming novel entitled A Country You Can Leave which I hope we get to learn more about today. Her most recent book is a collection of essays entitled Friends with White People, The Terror of Racial Intimacies, a very intriguing title. Um, and this collection will be coming out next year. She's professor and director of women's and gender studies at City College in New York, where she also coordinates the college's efforts to provide quality higher education to youth in New York City's juvenile facilities through the program College Collective. Please join me in virtually welcoming Professor Inkel Ajani. Asali, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, hi, um, thanks for having me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to um, reflect on, um, on this topic, uh, uh, Black Lives Matters Beyond Borders. Um, it, um, I think it's critical uh, that we that we put um, this at the forefront of Black studies and our Afro-diasporic framing, our scholarship, our writing, um, because the, as we know, as, as many Black scholars um, throughout, throughout the world have um, written, acknowledged, um, studied, analyzed, um, is the violence done to, to Black people against Black people. Um, so, it was it was an, an opportunity for me to um, think about my book in in this particular context in this particular moment um, and also um, thinking about this particular day um, October 28th so anyway um, I'm just I will say that and um, I don't know if um, if how you would like for me to do this Edwin if I should just sort of launch a little bit into maybe um, some of the context for for the book um, and then um, specifically talk about um, uh, Strange Trade, which is my book there. And mm -hmm. I have some things to say about that too. But anyway, um, so I'll go that ahead. That sounds and great, yeah. Great, great. So I have, um, I do have a collection of slides, but um, there's, it's really going to be me sort of doing a, a small, a small story, a small voiceover, if you will, um, about um, the images that I've pulled up. And um, for me, again, it's really about providing some context for the work. Um, so Strange Trade was, was uh, part of my doctoral uh, dissertation research. Um, I started off as an sort of reluctant anthropologist um, who has a long history, um, both personally um, and uh, uh, and as an activist with um, it, in and around um, the carceral state. Um, so 
as and some of you know, because you've read the book, um, the book is really about um, my time spent um, working with not just the two women who I worked with at Rabibia, which is a large, uh, a large uh, facility in based in Rome um, that houses both men and women. I was working there for over two, well, over a, about two, two and a half years um, on and off um, with both male and female uh, detainees, uh, mostly from all over, um, all over Africa, um, but also um, with detainees from Latin America as well. Um, so the, the project started off as a dissertation research as an anthropologist, I was doing um, an ethnography um, and it was actually many, many years ago <laughs> that I did this. So um, I'm gonna try to catch us up on some of the things that have just kind of put this all in context now. So, um, but let me go back in history a little bit. Let me share my screen first. So here we go. And tell me if we can do that, great. So, um, so today is, um, uh, marks the 98th year of um, Mussolini's march on Rome. Um, so the the black shirts, um, the fascists were interested in um, taking over the city. Um, they had planned it. it they, they planned it for this day. Um, and Mussolini came into power um, between October 27th and October 29th. So I just wanted to, I, I realized what today was and I thought, mm, this is um, an interesting moment. So I just have to uh, remark upon that. And we'll talk a little bit more about the fascist movements um, that are inspiring a lot of activism and uh, coordination globally too. So um, this happened, um, so, so right now, as we think about the questions of Black Lives Matter in the context of Italy, and I'm going to say that my comments today are going to be really focused on, on Rome because that's the context that I know the best. And I know that you'll have um, Heather Merrill Carter, Carter, who will be talking about Italy probably more generally um, and giving you more background. But, um, but my context happens to come from, from, from Rome and also Naples. I worked a lot in Naples as well. But um, what we're seeing now um, parallels very much what we're seeing in the US. So um, the, this image is taken from October 25th, um, where you have uh, uh, neo-fascists uh, um, protesting in the streets, fighting with the, the Carabinieri, the police, who are um, trying to impose curfews around COVID. Um, I, I realized that there was a something I wanted to show you that is not in my in my slides. Um, the Forza Nuova is um, is one of the is the the group responsible for these coordinated efforts throughout Italy of the neo fascists um, protesting in the streets, um, and they're very much sort of um, uh, much like the groups that we see in uh, Michigan um, and other and other places in the US. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that we talk or we can think about, um, as we think about these sort of coordinated efforts around um, Black Lives Matter in the context of Europe and elsewhere, um, the sort of global, um, the sort of global coordination or the global recognition that Black Lives Matter. Um, one of the more dis one of the disturbing elements of coordinated efforts has been the sort of rise of the right, um, and I think that that too should be part of our conversation um, um, around Black Lives Matter um, in this diaspora context because um, because we um, the 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 violence against Black people has been um, very much. Um, uh, being carried through um, these neo-fascist, these fascist organizations. Uh, we'll see that we see this in the US, um, and we see this in Europe, we see this also in Brazil, we see this all over. Um, so I think for me, um, in terms of thinking about part of it, part of it linking to my other project on, um, on uh, racial terror is um, an, an obviously an element of, of black lives that we, that 
that we can talk about in a diasporic frame as well, not just the protests, not just sort of the recognition of, but in fact, the violence against us, both in physical violence and, and um, legislative violence. Um, I wanted to also highlight, um, when I talk about um, the, my work was at Rabibia, I just, I pulled this image. Um, what I wanted to actually do, and I, and I, made a mistake here, so my apologies. There was one, there was one um, story that I did want to talk about and I don't actually have some images for that. So, um, so I'll just pause here. Um, in the context of um, these uh, protests, if you will, around um, the, what they're calling COVID protests and the COVID quote unquote lockdowns in all over Italy, um, these protests really started um, kind of after the summer as, as numbers were increasing. Um, so you see, for example, protests that were taking place and being coordinated among the neo-fascists um, from the early part of September up until um, today, basically. Um, and in, in this context, we had um, a, a very, um, perhaps not surprising, but um, we, there was uh, the murder of um, Willy uh, Montero Duarte, who is a, um, who is Italian um, of um, Capo, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Cape Verdean descent, Capo Verde. Um, so, um, and he was um, beaten to death by four men um, outside of Rome. And, um, and that sparked um, more protests um, uh, or counter protests, if you will, um, for, for in, in the recognition of his life. Um, ironically, um, because Willie had just turned 21 and he had just earned his right to claim his citizenship, which is another conversation that we should certainly have, um, it made me think a lot about um, the context of Black lives and how um, in, the, in the context of Rome, in the context of Italy writ large, how how, um, how place and status and citizenship um, plays into um, the ability to, um, to make claims about um, your personhood. And um, sorry if that's a bit convoluted, maybe we can talk about that in um, the Q&A. Um, I'm going to go ahead and continue on. This I wanted to say, um, as a precursor to the conversation around um, strange trade, excuse me one second. In um, the a precursor to the conversation around strange trade, um, what I wanted to, to say is that while the book was, while I did the research for the book in, um, in 19, gosh, so you know, this is old, uh, <laughs> it was, it was, um, in the context of the early, excuse me, the mid '90s to the early to early 2000, um, and then the book. It took me that long to write and to to pull it together and to wrap my head around um, the experiences that I had there. Um, and the book was published in um, 2010. Um, the one of the <sighs> the regrets, I guess you could say, that I have about the book, um, which has a lot to do with American publishing and other things that we can talk about. Um, one of the regrets was that I had spent so much time working in various facilities in Italy. And as I was sort of winding down my research at Rabibia, um, new forms of carceral spaces were opening up. Um, so, for example, here you have um, an image of, um, excuse me, of, of a, of a, um, I'm trying to translate this in my head, of a house of exclusion, of identification and exclusion, which is basically um, a, a detention center specifically for immigrants. Um, and this is um, right outside of Rome. And, um, and one of the things that, um, so, these, so these specific immigration uh, detention prisons um, were was cropping up from 1998 and, and are still 
alive to this day, right? Um, and they've changed names, they've changed various sort of draconian sort of measures. But one of the things that, um, there's a split now in Italy that I see um, uh, with the, with black, and, and I'm, I'm using the term black, but I, but it's more complicated than this, um, with black Italians, um, people who were, um, it, for those of you who read the book, maybe the children of some of the women and the men that I uh, worked with who were born and raised in, in Italy, but who um, did not have the privilege of, of, um, of having citizenship from Italy. So imagine in the US context, sort of um, people who were uh, um, like dreamers, like DACA um, folks who are there, who are are essentially feel stateless, right? Um, um, so what you have, um, what you have is a system where you have, a, on the one hand, you have a conversation around race and immigration that feels very much like, um, uh, you know, there are the masses, the quote unquote hordes of, of immigrants, this um, stranieri who are coming in, um, where in fact you also have a body, a whole body of people who are Italian, have been schooled in Italy, um, speak Italian as their first language, see, see themselves as Italian, but yet are, cannot claim Italian citizenship. And Willie, um, Willie Montero was one of those individuals um, who was killed by four white men. Um, and it's interesting to think about how he is discussed in the Italian media, um, where it's almost as if, um, so, the, so the black Italians who know what it's like to live as an Italian, but also someone who is Italian and, and from, and Nigerian or Italian and, Guyanese and, and from Ghana and, and also Italian and Colombian, um, people who experience their black and brown skin in the context of being Italian but not being Italian, they know that this is a racially motivated murder. Um, but yet the media, the politicians, very few of them will recognize that as um, being uh, a racially motivated murder, even though his murder fell on the, on the right out in this context of the, um, the uh, Forza Nuova and other fascist groups organizing, agitating both against COVID measures, but and also immigration and also race. So anyway, um, there's the, the context of anti-blackness in, in Italy, and then I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> in the context of anti-blackness is a really convoluted, um, it's a, it's a convoluted place, right? It's, um, you have, again, on the one hand, the conversations around immigration that we're supposed to imagine is a sort of recent, again, these hordes, we see all of these images of, you know, of people coming from elsewhere, it descending upon Italy and, um, politicians like uh, Salavini and others have really exploited that, that image. Sorry, excuse me. And, um, Okay, and then others of, you know, and then the other half of the story where you have people who are um, trying to live within this context, trying to make a home for themselves and be at home for themselves um, in this anti-Black context. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Um, and, um, and again, highlight that if I had to do it over again, um, the rise of these particular um, immigration uh, prisons from 1998 to this day, um, and this kind of split narrative around blackness and anti-blackness in the context of Italy would be um, a major feature of the work that I would do. And hopefully it's going to be part of any project, but um, we can talk about that too. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know we probably have a lot of questions and what I suggest is that if you do have a question you'd like to ask, just put the topic in the Q&A and then I'll um, call on you and essentially what we'd like to do is promote you to a panelist so you can um, show yourself and we can hear your voice and you can interact one-on-one -on -one with our guest. But um, while you think about your questions and topics, I have a couple of, a couple of things I'd like to start us off with. Um, one is um, 
your experience um, as as an African now I'm assuming as an African American woman um, crossing boundaries of inter different institutional spaces um, and different borders as a writer, as an activist, as a scholar. For me, that's something that was really coming out in Strange Trade in a lot of interesting ways. Um, and then the second question I had was, if you could talk about the essay you co-authored, um, Why Women Kill, which I thought was a really fascinating discussion of black women's rage and, um, and um, a lot of other things. Um, so if you had any thoughts on those two. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, hold on. We could be here all day. No, just kidding. Um, so, one of the things that I know I, I do talk about in um, in the in the book is that um, my father um, was also was was incarcerated. So I grew up um, in and around prisons um, and the conversation um, in prison. So it was always um, in the. I, actually, I'm a I'm a rare. Black Californian, <laughs> so we, you know, um, as as uh, African Americans in California, sort of um, uh, decrease in numbers. Uh, that's where I'm. That's where I'm from, and that's where I grew up. And um, and anyway, so uh, so yes. So thank you for the assumption, Edwin. I appreciate it. Um, in any event. Uh, so my my dad was incarcerated um, and held in federal prison for all, in fact, almost all of my life for uh, drug drug trafficking, um, and so um, I always had the um, prisons were always like kind of the first thing that was on my mind. I always knew um, where certain if we were going through a town, driving through a town, I knew that there was a prison there. I could tell the um, you know the landscape leading up to prisons these sorts of things just from from my childhood and then as i moved into um graduate school and college um it it was never far from my mind and it was a different time then because um we didn't have the amazing amount of scholarship and the amazing amount of work that we see on, on prisons um, and certainly nothing coming out of um, other places in the world if we did. Um, and certainly not by black scholars very much. And so that is the thing that I have been appreciating more and more in this, in this, um, in this kind of boom, if you will, of, of prison scholarship, mostly because I think a lot of us have been deeply impacted, personally impacted um, and um, and how can we not when we have over you know six million people who've had some kind of contact in the U.S. alone with um, the carceral state? So anyway, um, so moving through, I, I I used to joke about this when I was. Um, it was very hard for me to um, start the research in in Italy, um, and I. And I kind of fell into it because I was initially going to work with um, a black, with a black women's labor, um, immigrant labor organization, um, um, and a friend of mine was arrested um, and held in uh, the prison, uh, prison in Naples, and, and I couldn't gain access to her. No one could, and um, and so that got me to thinking, uh, how many, how many people from First of all, it was how many how many non Italians, how many um, Africans uh, were were held, being held, and and why, and then um, and then so so the first time I was able to get in, and they had lined up. Um, they thought I just wanted to come in and and to take a look. So they lined every African inmate um, in the women's facility um, at Rubibia. They lined up everyone against a wall, and there must have been 50 women, and they were all looking at me, and I was looking at them, thinking, I, I, yeah, you know, I don't know what, it, I didn't know what to say, and plus I was in my 20s, I think, and so it was, um, I wasn't sure if it was an act, an act of institutional intimidation. Um, so here you are, you wanted to meet with these, with these, uh, these African inmates, so here they are. Is sort of what they were the facility was saying um, and I had to keep going back and going back and going back to the Minister of Justice not 
not the warden, the minister of justice and making my request to get in. It was incredibly difficult. Now I see that there are these lovely Christian institutions in America that get to get uh, free tours of the of Rabibia and talk to inmates and you know get their view of the Italian criminal justice system. Um, so it's kind of funny. It's turned into this um, kind of propaganda machine for for the state. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Sorry if I sound a little bitter. Um, but no, I uh, mean, that's very interesting because in fact, um, you know, one of the other books that we read this semester is by a writer um, uh, uh, and anthropologist Didier Fassin, who wrote yeah. Enforcing Order. Mm -hmm. right? And another thing that he talks about is the difficulty of doing the work that he wanted to do on police practices. And so yeah. he was writing to ultimately to the Minister of the Interior. Mm -hmm. here you're writing to the Minister of Justice, and it just shows, you know, the guarded nature of the enterprise, which is indicative of, you know, a kind of state of democracy and, right. you know, sort of broader questions. Um, but please continue. Well, there was one other thing I wanted to say, which I think your your question also asked, and and in, in terms of thinking about this also is when you're when you're black and you're trying to do this work, it adds a whole other layer, right? I mean, it was immediately, um, it, you know, of course, and other people talk about this too. You're immediately met with suspicion. So the so when I was trying to. On, on my down days, I was trying to then try interview um, Carabinieri and also people who were working in and around um, uh, the drug enforcement. Um, they, their assumption was that I was there for, from the, what did someone say? Oh, they kept asking me if I was from the Nigerian, the Nigerian embassy. Um, and at one point I called the Nigerian embassy and offered my services to them. <laughs> saying, Look, I, I can, I, if, if you need some help, I, I can, you know, but I need some, I need some institutional backing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it didn't work, but, but I figured since everyone sort of made the assumption that I was going to. I was going to see if I could do that. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say about sure. that. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And um, again, if you have questions, you can just type even just the topic in the chat is fine. You don't have to write a full question. I know that's kind of intimidating. Um, but I want to start with um, Debbie Fagan. Debbie, you had a question. Do you want to... Um, if we can have her promoted to panelists, Deborah Fagan, and then um, you can ask your question. Hi, it's so lovely to meet you. That's nice um, to I <laughs> I'm in Dr. Hill's class. It's been a fantastic experience so far. Um, I did have a question. I wanted to get your thoughts on your personal experiences as an, as an African-American woman from California um, and your experiences in Italy contrasted with your experiences in America. I know you touched on it just now a little bit with how it's much more difficult to access certain things when you are African-American or even a woman. Um, so I was just wondering how that uh, that contrast was for you? Um, you know, it's funny because I think, too, the minute I said that, I also recognized how difficult it is um, even doing the work um, here in the U.S. Um, and it's funny because um, I think there are a tremendous amount of um, of black activists um, and people who raised me up in, in thinking about um, uh, organizing around uh, prisons, but also uh, political prisoners and prisoners of war for um, just to give you a sense of my background. Um, we, um, you know, the, the it was largely organizations run by black women um, who held it down for people who were who were inside. And, um, and so you know, the, the difficulty there, so, so for example, almost every time I go to Rikers, I always get um, funneled away from the largely white, um, uh, the largely white activist crowd, and I get funneled into the, the section of, of, um, of visitors. And and I'm and I know I'm not um, I'm not the only I'm not the only black or Latino um, activist or or vis or person who's going in as a 
um, as a programmer uh, for the for for it, for folks who are locked up. Um, I'm not the only person who's experienced that, right? Um, and um, certainly um, in some state and also federal facilities, having my um, being turned away entirely um, uh, when I arrive, even though I've been and I'm on the program, I've been invited. Um, so it's so I, I want to say it's not different that much different in the context of the U.S. Um, but I will say that there are there seems to be um, more there there seems to be um, grooves and channels here in the U.S. that are in existence because we have such a high rate of 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 incarceration and um, so once that prison has a program it's you can and you know you know the programmer you know the people who are coordinating it from the inside you know the CEOs who are who are in charge of it once you do that it's okay but it's finding those facilities um, and and establishing those ties um, that can be really difficult and there is um, and this is true of, of every facility including the ones in in I mean I've I used to work for um, um, I used to tour globally. So part of what I also do is um, uh, um, I, I work on the, the, comp, the, the issue of global mass incarceration writ large. So I have visited prisons in, um, in almost every continent in, in the US. Um, and so, or not in the US, sorry, I had a moment. I, in almost every continent I have visited um, a facility. Can we cut that out? Um, anyway, um, but in any event, the um, and and one of the things that you recognize, it doesn't matter if it's, a, you know, a fabulous, you know, uh, uh, facility that has um, rehabilitation in mind and education and family contact and all of these things. Those prisons, including ones that have absolutely nothing, all of those folks who are locked up. Um, have needs and those needs are not being met by the state. So prisons are really sites of, of failure, right? State failure, government failure, e um, economic failure, the whole thing. Not the failure of a human being, but the failure of the state, right? And, um, and so that's, for me, um, that goes beyond your question. But anyway, um, so that's what I've noticed. I've noticed that there's not that much, um, there, there are some differences, but um, yeah, <laughs> there are some differences, but but it seems to me that in the U.S. at least, um, there there are some there are stronger channels that you can you can attach yourself onto. Having said that, there in the context of I don't know if you're interested in working in facilities um, globally, but like in in France, for example, I know that there are um, excellent organizations, and those organizations are doing so much. So attaching yourself to an organization, um, to activist groups, that's, that's also really um, a great way to do this. And in fact, you know, all of these organizations globally need more, more, um, need more critical perspectives around working uh, around in, in these types of environments. And also um, in the European context and in the American context, um, there is a need for more Black and Latino folks to, to be present and part of that conversation. So. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. I wanted to follow up on that. You know, it's, um, it was, it's really interesting for me being someone who really works in a French context to go to Italy sometimes. And I really feel like the whole vibe is very different and that the way I'm sort of seen and kind of the gaze and everything is like different. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, just everyday experiences of people who are racialized as black or however, you know, one of the things we struggle with in this class is putting our notion of race in brackets. Um, mm -hmm. because we know that there's different ways that they function, you know, and you, you've highlighted so many of them. But I wondered if you could speak a little bit more generally about the everyday experiences of black women, especially. Um, yeah, there's um, so there's I, I'm, I'm trying to think of. Um, so so, yeah, there, there are definitely again, the some of the biggest differences comes from this uh, kind of split this divide between folks who are um, 
uh, and, and many of them are friends who have been born, raised, or grew up from a very young age in the Italian context, see themselves as Italian, but then in fact are not Italian. Um, they are neither, they've not been to Nigeria, but they are Nigerian. Um, and so they're trying to, again, you know, bridge these, these kind of common, I don't wanna, I don't, I, I don't wanna make it seem, um, I don't want to simplify it, but kind of bridging these sort of common uh, 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 splits, um, these fractures that we have, um, both as immigrants and as as black as black people, and as someone who should be or should be seen as a citizen who feels that they are of that place. There's that divide with folks who are more recently arrived and have different sort of. Um, uh, motivations or intentions or desires in terms of being there, right? Um, and in terms of thinking about the criminalization and the racialization, it's funny because my friends, uh, friends who've been, who are there, uh, who are black for all intents and purposes, um, uh, even if they are, their parents are, are um, from, from Ghana and, um, they they've been telling me because because this conversation um has come up actually post uh um post the murder of george floyd and also um brianna taylor um when we talk about the context of black lives matter in the u.s and, and then we and then kind of thinking about it in um in the italian context um the the conversation that i find that i think that most people that i've talked to um black women have been annoyed by is the sort of insistence on the italian left on the side of on the part of the italian left to to call um black folks who are from many different places in africa or at least whose parents are to call them afro italian as if there's some kind of equivalency um and that i found curious um there's a really there's a a, a fabulous writer um who is um um i'm trying to remember her um she has a blog but she also has a, a short story collection about being um a black Italian. Um, her parents are from Ghana. She was raised in Italy. Um, and her name is um, uh, Darja Khan. Um, I'll send you, I'll send you a link. Um, um, I'll send you a link, Edwin, um, so you can send it to your class. There's a, a, a wonderful, she has a, a, a blog, I think it's called, I'm sorry, um, Latte, Latte Riot. Uh, dot com or something like that. Anyway, she also talks about this, um, about the kind of insistence of, of um, the Italian left as sort of making these equivalencies um, as if it's sort of a radical statement, right? Um, and so there's something about naming that's also really important that, um, that will, I think that that conversation um, will, will start to take will start shaping the the context of blackness within Italy in a way that um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not Italian and I'm not a black Italian. Uh, so I can't, I don't know, um, but I, I can't wait for that work to come out. And there are also a lot of um, uh, black, black Italians, um, mostly from, from uh, Italy and, and Cape Verdean who are in the US who are doing PhDs who are writing about this now. Um, and that's exciting to me because um, they get to set the terms and, and I think that that's what really needs to happen. So that doesn't really answer your question, but um, it's an example of it. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, yeah, I look forward to the references. Let's keep going with the questions I wanted to go next to Kristen and then to Awul. So Kristen, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, so my question had to do a little bit about when you mentioned Willie Montero, how he had just reached the age, I'm guessing, of majority in, um, in Italy for getting his citizenship. So um, I'm interested in this question because I'm working like in a similar context, but in, in the French context about um, the two kind of main ways that Western democratic societies um, 
deal with uh, nationality law. And I was just kind of wondering about, I, I'm trying to find what my actual question was, what I wrote in the chat. <laughs> but um, I, I, I that. yeah. Right. So it was kind of about whether there is kind of an equivalent to juice solely, like the law of soil, mm -hmm. which we have in the US, of course, like if you're born in the United States, you are a US citizen. Um, in France, and I'm guessing just based on the rest of the answers that you, <laughs> that you all have been talking about, that that doesn't exist in Italy, or at least there's certain caveats. Um, it doesn't exist in Italy. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and so you can apply for citizenship uh, at the age, I believe it might be the age of 20 or 21. <laughs> um, and so one of the the big deals about um, Willy Montero's death um, was that he had just received his citizenship, right? So he wow. was, um, and um, and so I think that was in part part of the reason why um, uh, Conte, the the prime minister, showed up to his funeral and. Um, still refusing to to acknowledge that this was um, a racially motivated. I. I mean, it very, it's very clear, um, uh, you know, um, but in any event, um, yeah, it was a very, that, that was, that seemed to be like the biggest uh, scandal, part of the, part of the tragedy was that he just had become an Italian citizen. And yet the conversation around him was still as if he somehow was outside of, 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 um, of Italian of Italian citizenship and also Italian masculinity too. So right. that's another aspect of this, so. Right, wonderful, thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. I'm trying to go, trying to not talk too much. <laughs> no, please, okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Kristen. And yeah, I mean, the politics of citizenship and cultural citizenship are definitely issues that come up in the Italian context. Um, as well as the, the, I mean, the French context, and it sounds like the Italian context as well. Um, I wanted to go next to Awo. Awo, um, can you raise your hand? Um, apparently there's two Awos. Which Awo are you? And you can ask your question. Hi, it's good to meet you. Hi, um, I was just wondering, this is kind of a broad question, but um, based on the research that you've done specifically um, during your time at Rabibia and like um, other prisons, I was just wondering what reforms you've noticed that may need to be done to the prison industrial complex like globally and kind of going off of that, if there are trends that you've seen um, at the different institutions that you've been in um, that might point towards more universal reforms that need to be made? Uh, that's, a, that's a really excellent question. Um, I'm afraid I have a very short answer for that. Um, I, I think that um, one of the things that, that I see um, as being most successful um, are, are countries that, that essentially have done away with prisons altogether. Um, so, and I, I do consider myself a prison abolitionist, which is a whole other um, conversation. But um, so for those for, and, and not just for um, specific, uh, I mean, it's in the US context, everything, everything that is deemed as uh, transgressive is almost always met with, inc with, with incarceration, right? Um, uh, so, so, for example, in in other countries, for uh, like Sweden, for example, you know, if you are, um, if you have a mental illness, it there is very rare that you will be, um, you know, put into prison, a prison for something like that, right? Whereas almost, uh, you know, seventy five upwards of seventy five percent of our inmates have um, uh, mental health issues that um, that they're dealing with, and and so. Um, you know, I think for me, the short answer is that uh, countries that have moved towards decarceration have been the most successful and, um, and there's been a more, a, a stronger in, um, integration of people into society um, and addressing um, the problem at hand and not 
uh, criminalizing individuals um, for, um, you know, for drug addiction or for, um, or for other issues or poverty. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go next to Professor Perenas. I wasn't ready to be in a video because I have a baby screaming here. So I hope the baby does. <laughs> hi, Rissell. How are you? Hi. It's good to see you. Uh, Professor Perenas. Hi. 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 Good to see you. Yeah, so anyway, I, as you know, I like your work a lot, but I'm so interested right now. Also, I'm interested about the new work that you're doing, and I'm partic particularly interested in knowing more about the ties between the carceral state and the racialization of refugees, and particularly in Italy because it's so notorious. I mean, it all started with the treatment of Haitians in the United States, but it's since exploded, right, globally. But I think particularly it's so salient in terms of sort of the racialization of refugees and then the dehumanization that we're seeing of like black bodies. So I really wanted to know more about that because I know you probably have a lot of knowledge on this, you know, very important topic. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say that I know, um, so the, sh the short answer is that um, I, I, I'm guessing that Heather is going to, to cover sort of the, the broad strokes. Um, but I will say that what's been um, interesting to me as a person who, and I know you've worked in Italy for years and years and years too, so I know that we've both seen this sort of, this, this sort of incremental rise in, in all of this. Um, so, you know, um, the, the initial conversations in the mid to early 90s always, always rooted, so, so let me back up. The, I would say in the Italian context, specifically around anti-blackness, that that comes from the colonial, the colonial context, right? Um, when you look at, um, and a very good friend of mine, um, who's a novelist actually, um, uh, wrote about this. Um, when you look at the context of, of how Italians talked about specifically black women, but also, but just black bodies in general, there's been some, there's been a continuation of that, right? Um, and then in the, when I was there um, working initially uh, in the 90s, you see those same sort of conversations, particularly around like, um, as you know, uh, race and sex, uh, hypersexualization, uh, uh, the criminal uh, criminalization around black male bodies, um, all of that was was there, but it's also rooted in this um, colonial tradition. And so what I'm finding now is that there's more of a kind of a concerted effort. It's almost as if these these conversations around um, black bodies and anti-blackness um, have sort of formed in what I'm what I'm calling like the <laughs> this sort of this anti-black Maghrebi kind of zone, right? So you have um, countries like Libya, countries like Spain, countries like, um, well, Greece isn't part of the Maghreb, but you know what I'm saying? Like in this zone where people are, they see, they're seeing more and more um, uh, migrants coming, refugees coming from places, other places in the world, and not just Africa, but also Syria and elsewhere, all of that gets racialized within the context of black. If there's one, a friend of mine who's, um, uh, who writes about this says, oftentimes there could be a, an entire boat of, of uh, refugees from Syria, but maybe, and maybe one, one uh, dark skinned black person on the boat and the whole, the whole conversation will be about black migrants, African migrants coming to invade the, the shores, right? Um, and that was really, 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 um, that was picked up in 2002, all the way up through and through tw tw uh, 2014, when there was another shift in Italian immigration laws, which also kind of recriminalized the question of, um, so you had in 2002, the Bossi Fini um, law, which criminalized entry um, making it formal to be um, undocumented and criminalized. And then you had that reshift in 2014. And then again, um, Salvini, who was thankfully only um, 
in office for 14, I think it was 14 months in 2018 to 2019, really pushing these very, like beyond worse than Trump in some ways, like incredibly racist, um, uh, no holds bar sort of uh, discussions um, around, around uh, race and, and, and refugees. Um, and so there's been, there's been an attempt now um, from 2019, September 2019 and beyond to have a corrective, but um, I don't see that this is happening, especially in the, the context of COVID and the rise of the neo-fascists um, in this moment. So anyway, that's, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Congratulations on the baby. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was a great question. Great um, discussion. Can we go now to Tita Rosenthal? Sorry. Um. Hi. Hi. How are very, you? Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. I. Um, have the pleasure of being uh, in Edwin Hill's class this semester. Um, he's a, invited me to take part and uh, to listen to the wonderful conversations that he's having with students about all of these materials and all of these really important issues. Um, I have the background of, uh, of having lived in Rome. I was born in Rome and so it was my first city and uh, lived there for the first part of my life, um, and I'm a professor of Italian, so that's the, my background. Um, if I could just bring you back for a moment to the writing of the book um, that we read for the course. Uh, there's so many questions I have of it, and I wanted to tell you how very much um, I loved reading it. Um, I wanted just to ask you a little bit about uh, what was your process in writing? Um, you have an extraordinary ability to recreate a moment of the interaction between you and the women you were meeting. You put us there in a, as if we're meeting them with you and talking to them. And there's just this enormous vibrancy. And, but at the same time, we can feel the reticence and the, at the same time, and sometimes fear and nervousness that you had in their presence that sort of changes over time. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your process. Did you, I'm asking, um, did you write a, a diary or, or a journal that you would keep every day? Because there's this, like I say, this uh, tangible sense of being in the room with you. So was it a journal that you kept? Um, and I'm asking also wondering, you made a comment earlier uh, today about being a kind of a reluctant anthropologist. <laughs> and I, I wonder if, if you, what you mean by that is that um, you can accumulate all of this information about a person and all of your experiences of a person, but where does the activism come in when you have all of that, the burden of knowledge, the burden of sort of witnessing what it is that they've gone through, admiring these women and what they've done and how they've done it at the same time that it, within the prison situation, um, as a scholar of it or of people's lives, you want to then also, of course, be the activist who's going to change that life for the next group of women who come after them if there are such women. And so my question is double, sort of a little bit about the process of writing because it was so, it's so wonderful. And two, um, whether the, that, if that's what you meant about being a reluctant anthropologist, that, you, that there's just this boundary where you can't get beyond in order to, to do the kind of activist work you wanted to be able to do. Um, first of all, I have to say that that's a really beautiful question. Um, it actually, there's something about the way that you asked this that kind of made me um, tear up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so there's, so I appreciate, I really appreciate the question. Um, I, you know, I, I think 
there's, there, there are many answers to this, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, the, the logistical part in terms of thinking through the writing process itself was, um, I, I try to, um, I say this often to, to people who read the book or to my students who might ask, um, when I was doing the research, it was an incredibly lonely time. And so, um, you know, you can imagine, so I, I and I, it was also a, a bit of a, in hindsight, a bit of a traumatizing time in, in, as well, because I would go to the, I would go to the facility every morning, Monday through Friday. Um, I would be there at eight and I would probably leave at 8 p.m. And it was hours upon hours of talking to people, being in the facility, being in prison, and, um, and because after a while they sort of forgot that I was there, um, I had this sort of free range to, to not exactly total, not complete free reign of the, of the facility, but I was pretty much left to my own devices. Um, but I, so, so that became my context after a while um, of being in Rome was really being at Rubibia every day. Um, the only time that I would be out in the world was on my way to and from and the occasional weekend. Um, and um, anyway, so I, I spent a lot of time journaling and a lot of, uh, there were a lot of letters that we wrote back and forth. So I have um, just uh, file cabinets and file cabinets of, of of writing by by the women by my I, not so much my letters but their letters which then I use to sort of recreate um, these moments and the book initially was supposed to be um, a sort of a more um, even more in depth sort of um, book about um, almost all of the forty plus women that I spoke to um, it was just it was it was just too overwhelming um, after a while and so my editor was like pare it down um, to these to this um, and so um, so yeah so that's the short answer to that was that lots of letters lots of journaling because I was in fact so terribly alone I felt um, and also out of context in many regards um, the activism question, to be clear for me, I, I feel like um, the, I'm the, let me back up. The reluctant anthropologist comes from my desire to write. And um, I did not come of age in um, graduate school or in academia when you could do both or you could do many things, right? We had to, sorry, we had to, stick to a path and that's what we had to do. Um, if you were working on, on prisons, you had to cite your Michel Foucault, which is very useful and of course, you know, important, you know, and, and I did it. But I also, also realized that um, the kinds of stories that I, the kind of book I wanted to ultimately write, um, I wanted other people to read it and not just people, um, and not just people who are in carceral studies, right? Um, and so it took me a long time to figure out how to, to become a creative writer, but that was also going back to a long held desire. And part of the reason why I went into anthropology in the first place, my first introduction into anthropology was through Zora Neale Hurston. And, and once I realized that you could be an anthropologist and write books like Zora Neale Hurston, if you were lucky, um, then um, that's, that's when I was like, oh, well, I want to be an anthropologist because I want to, because I long to write like Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and so anyway, I, so I say that I'm reluctant because of the writing part of that. The activism for me has always been, up until fairly recently, very separate. Um, so I'm always, I get a little squeamish when, when um, you know, I myself call myself an activist or when other people call me an activist because I see in, in a context in, in this, say for example, in an academic context, because I, um, I, don't, I don't see oftentimes or at least I didn't until recently, um, see the work that I was doing as being activist in orientation. Um, uh, you know, I thought my activism had to really be what it was, um, you know, outside of my nine to five, which is boots on the ground, going in, doing this, agitating, whatever it was, right? Um, 
And, um, and it's only been recently and with age <laughs> that I understand that, that um, any form of resistance, any act of, of, of trying to rehumanize ourselves in the face of these institutional failures, that, that, that is activism as much as these, you know, neo-fascists who are out there, they're doing their activism too. And we're countering that. And that's, that's activism and living well, that's also activism. So I think that I constantly am reminding my students of these things that um, we need, we need all of those things. We need the joy, the creativity, the, um, that's what keeps our purpose. Um, anyway, I won't get on my soapbox. I'll stop here. So I hope that was an answer. I, that was a really wonderful answer. And, and, and I love that definition of activism. Um, I think it's, it's fabulous and really helpful for, for all of us to hear. Thank you so much. And thank you. Great, let's go to a couple of students next. Let's go to Leia and then we'll go to Emmanuel. Hi. Hi, Leah. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed your, um, your book. It's something that like really resonated with, with me when you said, like, as someone being afflicted by the system, that there's always this feeling of that you need to go back or going back, because my father is also incarcerated. And so, like, there's always this feeling of me, like, fighting with the system or, like, feeling like I need to go there to do something or, like, I don't want to commit a crime to go there, but, like... <laughs> needing to be there and like right to hear that narrative this narrative and so i was wondering like what are some leaders or readings or events that resonated with you and what is the perception of black women in the italian society having to deal with the male gaze and the white gaze and also how does your americanness how is your americanness treated in italy so um one of the things that um uh so the americanness is always ironically um you know, the thing that um, saves, save, like, at least for me, saved me in some respects. Um, I'm sure also being as, you know, light skinned also, um, uh, although, you know, people used to uh, kind of misidentify me in, in strange ways, but that's another story. Um, but the Americanness, my friends who are Italian, who are um, who's, who, who are, who are black, who are, whose parents are from Nigeria, always joke that they immediately, when they go into a store, they don't speak to, they don't speak to each other in Italian, they speak to each other in English, and so they can get service, right, and that sort of, to me, harkens back to, um, you know, when I, one of the first memoirs that I read that, you know, changed my life was the was the autobiography of Angela Davis and when she talks about going into the shoe store and speaking French to her sister so she could get you know good treatment like that that to me it's sort of it's that it's that right um so there is that cachet that I think um uh that Americanness sort of raises with it raises here and 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 I just want sorry I want to pause for one second because the thing that's so interesting to me about the protests with, for um, Willie um, Montero Duarte was that no, there weren't, it wasn't a Black Lives Matter protest for him, and it should have been, right? Um, it, what it was, the, the slogan was, ciao Willie, ciao, like, you know, come on. And, and I know that for my friends who are activists, um, who are Black activists in, in Italy, in, they were incredibly insulted, right? Um, but again, that's sort of the cachet of the sort of the American, the Americanness of this, right? And even the, again, the insistence of, you know, the left, the Italian left kind of doing a, you know, Afro-Italian sort of designation. You know, anyway, that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to point that out. The, um, you asked me a second part of the question. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I asked, what, was, what is the perception of Black women in Italian society? Like, and yeah. So, um, so, and it hasn't changed much from when I started doing, um, when I first started working. So, so Black women um, are incredibly much like here in the U.S., but incredibly, incredibly um, hypersexualized. And, um, and the gaze is very, it's all, that's what it is. 
And so there used to be, I, I think I wrote an article about this many years ago about um, how the representation of um, the ways that black women were criminalized, um, mostly African, uh, Nigerian and Ghanaian women and other women um, who were criminalized in, in Italy was through the context of, of, of being called a prostitute, right? Or being thought of as a prostitute. So there have been women who would just go out to be out in in you know let's say they're on their way to a party and they would be rounded up um there was a story actually not too long ago of a group of women who um, black women who uh, i believe were senegalese they would gone out um they were arrested accused of being um prostitutes had their hair cut because that is the ultimate sign and of the kind of state oppression um which was a tactic that the police used to um use against um the 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 roma because hair long hair is a cultural signifier and, and very important to them um and somehow they also understood that black women pay money to get their hair done and that was also a cultural signifier and so they, there was a scandal that took place in um a, i want to say it was outside it was outside of rome um where the the carabinieri had cut um the hair of of several women uh when they detained them so anyway so that's that's what um i think that i hope that answers your question at least partially it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah. Thanks. Can we go to Emmanuel next? Oh, hey, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, how are you? All right. Fantastic. Doing well. How are you? Good. Good. Well, um, my name is Emmanuel, and I just want to obviously thank you for being here. Uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying your book, and I don't even like reading, so <laughs> I think it's so fantastic. Um, like I'm flipping through the pages, and I feel like I'm, you know, sitting in front of Pauline or Mary, and I'm like sweating and intimidated. Um, and another thing, like I, I feel like I'm flipping through the pages, and I kind of. Obviously, as like an undergrad student, I feel like my, my question is a little selfish just because I kind of wanted to ask like your, your personal experience with uh, how you found anthropology as I guess like your calling because um, as I'm like reading the book, I, I'm hearing these stories uh, and it's really, really powerful stuff and these stories obviously need to be told, these voices need to be heard and I'm sitting here like, you know, this is great stuff. Like I could see myself doing something like this too. So I just wanted to, you know, inquire about your personal journey and how you kind of found yourself, uh, even though you kind of stay close to home because uh, like your parents and all that good stuff, but I just want to ask about that. <laughs> um, so I will say this, I just want to encourage, actually, I was going to say this also to, um, was it Leah too? Like, you know, the, the thing is, is that writing, for me, writing is, is um, yeah, we, we definitely, we need more writing and more stories. Our stories need to be told. That's what I'm going to say. In terms of in terms of your interests, in terms of you doing this, and in terms of anthropology, I even though I am um, I still consider myself a reluctant anthropologist, mostly because I wanted to be a creative writer. I always wanted to write. I always wanted to be a, a writer. That's what I really wanted to be. But no one, um, if you come from a family like mine, people are like, you, you know, no, nobody's going to pay you for that. And then of course, you know, I had the grandmother who was like, um, you can't write, you can't look, I read some of your work, you can't write. So anyway, so thank you, grandma. Um, anyway, so, um, so I, so I wasn't, it wasn't, writing wasn't necessarily um, uh, a thing that I thought, I, I knew I wanted to do it, I didn't think I could do it. Um, so anthropology for me became a pathway into, into this, right into into academia into into school really because um i was sort of as an undergrad um not really sure what i wanted to do and i went to a school where i was lucky enough to create my own major so i i majored in black in what i call critical black studies <laughs> and and then realized that that wasn't going to get me a job um and so then my favorite teacher happened to be um an anthropologist and and then i read zora neale hurston and i thought 
this is the bridge. Having said that, anthropology, sociology, all of the stuff that we're doing, and this is what I appreciate so much about um, the, this push to, to make the institutions, whatever institutions they are, see us as full human beings, because we get to, we now, I think there are more people who are doing these kind of hybrid types of writing, um, scholarship, plus memoir, plus fiction, plus all this experimental stuff, whatever it is, people who are doing soundscapes as work, um, there's a lot of exciting work going on. And I think I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to find a thing that you love and just run with it and make other people, I'm not going to say bow down to you, but <laughs> make other people adhere to what it is that you want to do. Right. So, um, so I really want to encourage you to do that. All of you. So you set the terms of the debate. Don't let them. Okay. I don't know who they are, but you know what, I, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's sweet. Thank you. Hey, and, uh, and another thing that makes the book so great is you're like making these women human. Like I think oftentimes, especially with, I guess, criminals, we separate their human nature because of, I guess, their past or the circumstances that they've been put in. But, we see the human size of Pauline or Mary in these situations that they even put in. So yeah, I really appreciate your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about that. Um, it was something I referred to earlier, which is your essay, Why Women Kill. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, one of the things, you know, like as Emmanuel was saying, like, the book makes you think differently about crime, about why, how people get involved in crime, particularly African migrant women. And, um, you know, the article really makes us, uh, it sort of interrogates the ways in which we understand black women's violence and black women's rage. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how your work is um, maybe changing or kind of working on the ways in which we understand black women and crime um, today? Um, thank you, Edwin, that's a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, and thank you for reading the, the article too. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so, I've, so it's funny because um, I didn't realize that a lot of my work um, kind of cycled around this question of rage um, and, um, and also certain motivations that, um, that carry me through life also um, revol revolve around rage. Um, and when I was doing work recently, um, including my, on my novel too, which is also addresses this issue of, of female rage in a, in a kind of different context, but still um, it, within the context of uh, Black women and, and violence. Um, one of the things that I, I realized when I went back into, um, uh, so I, I stopped working in facilities for a little while as one-to-one -one with interviewing um, and teaching um, uh, in prisons uh, just because of other, other projects, other things that I was doing, other work, life, whatever. Um, but uh, about two or three years ago, I, st I started going back in and, and doing some teaching and some work and um, meeting all these women who had, um, were refusing, again, refusing to be um, named, classified, um, let, their, let their designation, um, their, their prison sentences sort of define who they were. Um, and, um, and seeing that that their response to, to the violence that was inflicted upon them was met with this sort of um, kind of rage and insistence on dignity. Um, and that, that like, yeah, that, that got me up in the morning. I just realizing that, you know, um, that. So um, seeing, especially within the context of domestic violence, um, which I think we still have a lot of work to do around um, thinking about how, um, you know, this notion of survivors and the notion of, of victims, all of these things. Um, I think that one, what was so good for me was to meet and work with women who, who saw that they were really just, um, they, were, they were killing in the name of their own dignity. And I think the, my co-author, 
um, uh, who um, also does work on this and she does work um, uh, in Sri Lanka in, um, with uh, female fighters. Um, you know, for her, the, the, in the context of political violence, um, you know, there are certain, let me back up, there are certain forms and certain ways that, that women can express their anger and their rage, um, very rarely through violence, but um, there are moments where we where where that is acceptable, um, and that's only acceptable, as I say in the, this article, in the context of um, you know standard ground law. Even though we don't, we black women definitely do not get to exercise that right as much as white women do, um, and um, and in the context of political violence, as long as it's outside the context of the U.S. and and, and if it's a U.S. evaluator of that political violence, sometimes, not always, but sometimes that violence will be deemed as being legitimate. Um, so that was part of, so when Nimi and I were having this conversation about rage and violence um, and when it was quote unquote appropriate for women, um, and we were, we were kind of comparing notes because I'd been working with women who, um, who were, um, who were detained, arrested for um, murdering their children um, and uh, for, a, for a project. And we were talking about how the narratives of these women um, were very much like the women that she had been working with um, who were picking up arms and trying to, to fight um, against uh, state violence. And so for us, both of those, these, these groups of women were, um, were seen as being um, not within their not within their quote unquote right minds, right? There always had to be some external forces that were, you know, making them work against their nature. Um, and if it and if there wasn't something that was making them work against their quote unquote nature, then they must just be bad women, right? Like a mother wouldn't kill her child, right? Um, for example. And so that got us to think about the literature on women and rage and and violence and Anyway, there's more work to be done on, on this um, within these two contexts, but that's kind of a long answer to your, to your question. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. It gives me a lot, to, a lot to think about and to think about also the different ways that maybe um, people, women who are racialized as black, how their, how their rage gets read in these different contexts and the different laws that sort of do the reading and analyzing and, and categorizing. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying um, about the importance of the narratives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Can I, and I just want to say one thing about that. I think that black women in particular are um, asked to apologize mm -hmm. in ways um, for their rage that at least that's what I'm seeing. And in, in, so when you look at, um, uh, prison sentences and and or the ways when 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 sentences are meted out um, by the courts, um, I've been looking at the the ways that uh, judges um, the the sort of narrative story behind um, those sentences when they're handed down, right? And what the expectations are through parole boards, through through um, through th these public hearings. Um, you know, what, what the expectation is of Black women to apologize or to show some quote unquote remorse, right? So it's, it's really, I don't know, there's, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting, so. Well, that's really, um, that's really intense. Um, I wondered if we could, um, oh, I guess we can't, <laughs> we're I'm running out of time, but you have so much, you said I wanted to uh, learn more and talk more with you about global fascism and white nationalism or uh, you know that's taking place uh, around the world and um, but um, I see we're we're running out of time I don't want to keep people over <laughs> but um, and um, I had so many um, other questions uh, that we'll have to save for another time but um, you've given us a lot to think about you've given us a lot to read um, your novel, give us a, a plug one more time for your novel. Oh gosh, um, I don't know what to say about that. It's, um, yeah, it's a book about uh, 
uh, women, rage, um, race, immigration. Um, it's actually set in the U.S., but there are um, other countries that are represented in the book. Um, uh, yeah, and then the other book, uh, Friends with White People, um, uh, The Terror of Racial Intimacies, actually covers a lot of the conversation around um, white supremacy and violence, um, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens with that. So anyway, I know we have a, um, many more conversations to have, hopefully. So, but thank you so much, Edwin, for inviting Thank you so much for coming and yeah. for all the work you're doing. And we look forward to reading more and having you back in the near future, I hope. Yeah, thank you. And, and Jerome, thank you also, because um, I know you're, you guys are co-teaching the class. So I, are you co-teaching or? Well, he's a team, he's oh, team yes. in the discussion yeah. sections, but we're co-teaching. Sorry, sorry, yeah. yes. Sorry. Thank, thank you anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> your, your labor is recognized, yes. Exactly, okay. <laughs> exactly. It's crucial, right. let me tell you. Um, okay, okay, thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.